All right, why don't we get started? I'd like to welcome you to our special lectureship today. Whether you're with us in person or joining us online, welcome to you all. It is our enormous pleasure to welcome Reverend Dr. Jennifer Powell McNutt as this year's presenter of our lectures in Reformation Theology and History here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Dr. McNutt is the Franklin S. Dearness Associate Professor in Biblical and Theological Studies at Wheaton College. She is also a fellow in the Royal Historical Society and an ordained teaching elder in the Presbyterian Church USA. Dr. McNutt earned her MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary and her PhD in Reformation Studies from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Her first monograph entitled Calvin Meets Voltaire, The Clergy of Geneva in the Age of Enlightenment was awarded the Frank S. and Elizabeth D. Brewer Prize by the American Society for Church History. In addition to a variety of journal articles and book chapters, Dr. McNutt has co-edited several volumes related to the Bible in the 16th century, Reformation, and is presently working on monographs related to the history of the French Bible and the social history of John Calvin's thought. On a personal note, I first met Dr. McNutt almost 15 years ago in the city archive of Geneva, Switzerland, as she was conducting research, I think probably for your doctoral dissertation. Uh, then, as now, I've admired not only her careful and significant scholarship, but also the warmth, enthusiasm, and graciousness with which she engages her students and other scholars. No wonder, then, that Westmont College honored her as Alumna of the Year in 2017, praising her work as a professor who cultivates, here I quote, thoughtful scholars, grateful servants, and faithful leaders for global engagement with the academy, church, and the world. Wow, that's high praise indeed. Dr. McNutt's lecture this afternoon has the intriguing title that many of us have been talking about, When Commas Save Lives, the interplay between the Reformation Bible and theology in the interpolation of the Johannine comma. Dr. McNutt, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here with you all today and to deliver the second annual lecture. And after Richard Muller, no less, um, thank you to Scott Manich for the invitation. Um, and I was going to tell the story about meeting Scott in the Geneva archives. And I was going to say, I think that's probably a cliche at this point uh, to say that you met Scott in the Geneva archives. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's been such a a pleasure to collaborate with you over the years, and I appreciate you so much, and your fantastic scholarship continues to be a wonderful resource. Thank you. Um, any good lecture must somehow give an account for the title that was chosen. And in this case, I want to explain by simply stating that I am married to an academic editor. <laughs> And what that means is that commas are no joke in our household. <laughs> My husband, Dr. David McNutt, is both plagued and blessed by the editor's eye that notices each and every grammatical error anywhere and everywhere we go. And this is, of course, a huge plus for me as a scholar, but um, restaurant menus beware. Uh, <laughs> and I have it on the best authority that is all of the internet memes. And we're going to post one of them, maybe. that commas save lives. <laughs> I hear that this is on the, the door of a wonderful colleague. Yes. <laughs> there we go. So um, this morning, I always like to start with a little humor. Um, so this morning, I want to explore a different kind of comma, um, but one that had a life-saving capacity all the same during the Reformation period. Our text comes from 1 John 5b, which would become identified as verses 7 and 8 from the mid-16th century. Um, oh, gosh, and this is why I wanted my PowerPoint. <laughs> I was going to put the text up there for you. So you do have a handout, and you have the text in French. Let me just say it in English for you. It's, for there are three who bear witness, 
in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, and there are three who bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. That portion in between, um, who bear witness from in heaven, Father, Word, Holy Spirit, these three are one, and there are three who bear witness in earth, is considered the Johannine comma. All right, so that pericope within that text is considered a comma. That is that it comes in the middle of two sentences. Um, so I want to just provide a little grounding. So I'm going to unpack that and what that means. This paper is an interdisciplinary undertaking uh, that seeks to gather Reformation history, theology, and Bible history using a variety of methods, including historical theology, social history, and material history. And that's my effort to ensure that everyone's interest is piqued, but no one is completely satisfied. <laughs> My work is intrigued by the complexity of the Reformation's engagement with scripture. And this interest has taken me into research on the Apocrypha, as well as on the book of James. And one of those pieces has already been published and one is in the works. I'm currently wrapping up the Oxford Handbook of the Bible and the Reformation as co-editor with Herman Selderhaus. And I became interested in this topic um, many years ago, when as a 20-year-old Westmont College student who was pursuing a biblical languages concentration, I visited the John Rylands Library at the University of Manchester. And I held the St. John Papyrus, known as P52, in my hands in its glass case. And I don't think they allow you to do that anymore, is my guess. So I still remember that moment, holding the earliest portion of any New Testament writing ever found. Um, and that is seared in my mind. T today's exploration of the comma touches on work exploring the Catholic epistles for the Reformation Commentary on Scripture volume that I am co-editing with Derek Cooper, which is also overseen by yours truly, Scott Manich, as well as Timothy George. But I don't undertake this topic because it is a live question today. It's important to recognize from the outset that although there are plenty of points of disagreement among modern biblical scholars about exegesis and translation, the imposition of this comma in, John, in 1 John 5 does not happen to be one of them. When we come to this text then, this is spoiler alert, we bring the benefit of as much assurance as possible that this is an interpolated text, meaning that it is added to the later transmission of the text. So there's no conspiracy of silence here. Um, as New Testament scholar Daniel Wallace has summarized, the comma is present in only eight late manuscripts, and half of these include the words in a marginal note. The plot thickens when we realize that the majority of these manuscripts originated in the 16th century. Oops. Out of the eight, the earliest manuscript to include the comma known as Codex 221 is a 10th century text, included the reading in a marginal note, which was a note added at some point after its original composition. Essentially, that means that there is no evidence of a Greek manuscript, including the comma, in the body text until the 1500s. And even that reading was composed after the first edition of Erasmus's Greek and Latin New Testament. That's in 1516. We know that the passage was regarded nonetheless as key to the Latin text because it is cited at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 in the second canon as a rejection of the Arian heresy. And this is further advanced by Thomas Aquinas's references to the Fourth Lateran Council. Okay, so the comma is not in question in that regard. So if we already know that it's not an interpolation, why track the story? The main reason I want to draw this topic out for our consideration relates less to the interpolation and more to what we can understand about the early modern interplay that took place between scripture and theology as reformers figured out how to sort out the comma. The comma highlights the complexities of those decisions as well as the history of textual, historical, and grammatical criticism 
As the transmission of biblical text moved from the medieval scriptorium on the one hand to the printing press on the other. The comma serves then as a reminder of the way in which the history of the Reformation is inextricably linked to textual, material, hermeneutical developments and media relating to the Bible. And these are dynamic realities that must also navigate political and ecclesiastical systems with cultural and social dimensions. That's a lot. <laughs> This complex engagement with the Bible during the Reformation, and that's by all accounts, by, not just by Protestants, by all camps, is reflective of and generative of the complexity of the era. And at the center of the Reformation story, in my view, is the Bible. The early modern hermeneutical landscape spanned broadly to include the hyper sola scriptura of the evangelical rationalists on the one hand, who would not use a theological term that was not represented letter for letter in scripture, to the spiritualists who advanced the advent of a new revelation beyond the so-called dead word of the biblical scholars. Bible translations balance, meanwhile, between dynamic and functional equivalence in their translations as confessional identity was crystallizing and vernacular language rapidly developing. Disagreement over the normative or regulative principle in matters of adiaphora or non-essentials reflects concurrent conversations, not only over the boundaries of scripture's teachings, but also the boundaries of the scriptural text itself. Textual variants in general, but specifically the Johannine comma in the Reformation era, brought all these matters to a head because of the importance of the question raised, namely, what is the authentic text? Renaissance humanist Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam and the translation of the New Testament is where our story begins. It's no exaggeration to say that Erasmus's impact on the Bible on, in this era is extraordinary, particularly when we appreciate that he was considered lowborn at a time when social mobility was far from the norm and then elevated to a height of fame that few could ever expect to attain. The revolution in media made that possible, but even just the fact of the printing press alone was not enough. As Andrew Pedigree's book, Brand Luther, explains, one needs to appreciate how very difficult it had been for living authors to win hearing it all. The, mo the most published authors of the first age of print were almost all historic figures. This stranglehold of the departed, I love that phrase, was much resented by the new generation of aspiring authors, which is why those who did make the breakthrough, such as Desiderius Erasmus, were so much admired. Conversely, this also means for Erasmus he couldn't hide his identity behind his critical work on the Bible, particularly his work on the comma. Erasmus' attention to the biblical text began in 1504 when he discovered in Park Abbey near Leuven a manuscript by Lorenzo Valla called the Collatio Novi Testamenti, which compared Greek and Latin biblical texts and was composed in the mid-15th century. It really spur he was spurred on by Valla's approach and Erasmus published the Collatio in 1505 and then he launched his own project of revising the translation of the Latin Vulgate in conversation with Greek manuscripts and providing annotations to justify any differences that resulted. In March 1516, Erasmus published his Novum Instrumentum, which is famously remembered today for being the first Greek New Testament published in Europe, alongside, though, his Latin translation. In fact, Erasmus' Latin translation of the Greek text had begun years before in Cambridge, which is reflective of his original purpose in undertaking the task of retranslation. And we can actually see this from his own hand in the annotations where he describes Greek as the helper in restoring the true version of the Vulgate. The fact that the Greek New Testament was also never separately 
published in its own edition, while Erasmus' Latin translation was, on several occasions, indicates that this work was undertaken primarily for the sake of the Latin. But that's not what he's famous for. <laughs> the placement of the column of Greek side by side with the Latin seems to have been the idea of Basel publisher Johann Froben, who was racing to market ahead of Spain's Complutensian polyglot. In the flurry of getting the text to the printer, probably because Erasmus was not originally expecting to publish the Greek, Erasmus used Greek texts available to him in Basel, which were all incomplete, minuscule codices dating from the 12th to the 15th century. Erasmus had already ruffled feathers with Praise of Folly printed in 1511, and concern was expressed over how the Latin Vulgate translation would fare under the so-called grammarian's eye, since alteration of the text was perceived as sacrilegious for a translation that was believed to be inspired. Humanism at this time was emerging on the fringes of scholarship and faced disparagement for its methodological approach. Erica Rummel's work has shown how Erasmus's philological approach to scripture was challenged and criticized by scholastic theologians who were appalled at the idea of a, quote, theo sorry, <laughs> theologizing humanist. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Okay. The flame was stoked when Erasmus did not refrain from altering the substance of the Latin expression in his attention to style. His translation and edits carried the weight of serious theological implications in matters relating to penance, sacraments, cooperative grace, and in the case of the Johannine comma, relating to the doctrine of the Trinity. The timing of these decisions matters, and I really appreciate an article by David Whitford on this. He has stressed this part of it. When Ara Erasmus's first edition of the Greek New Testament was published in 1516 without the comma, those were the early days before Martin Luther entered the scene. It was before Luther's treatise against scholasticism in 1517 and, of course, before the 95 Theses. Both the first and the second editions of Erasmus's New Testament were published before Luther's excommunication in January 1521 and condemnation at the Diet of Worms months after. And as the Spanish crown began to censor the Lutheran groups in the Netherlands, leading to the first martyrs of the Reformation, Erasmus began to shift in his attitude about whether to keep the comp or whether to restore the comma or not. In part, the restoration of the Johannine comma in 1522, that's Erasmus's third edition, should be understood in light of the tumult of the 1520s that surrounded Luther in the Netherlands and all that he represented for ecclesiastical and political forces at that time. Now, even with that alteration, actually, the Spanish Inquisition still investigated Erasmus's scholarship in 1527. You don't want that. Um, <laughs> Erasmus was indeed hard pressed to explain himself after the first edition, so that's 1516. Accusations of reviving Arianism and undercutting the authority of the church were levied against him by Edward Lee and carried the possibility of a death sentence if threats landed. Although he did his part to explain through the second edition of the annotations why the comma was not included, his explanations and the changes he made to the second edition were insufficient in light of the shifting landscape. And David Whitford's article highlights, for example, and explains how this is the reason for him changing the title to Novum Testamentum, which is what we would expect. And also, um, he adds in Athanasius's name, and he adds Gregory of Nazianzus's name to the title page. <laughs> so that's really good <laughs> way to address this accusation. <laughs> All right, so, um, but it wasn't enough. Um, so Erasmus, though, did, he restores the comma then in his, his third edition of 1522. And it's said that he does this as you can track his correspondence after being presented with what is known today as minuscule Codex 61, um, which is housed at Trinity College, Dublin. And it's the first Greek manuscript known to attest to the comma. 
um, conveniently, um, it was presented to him. <laughs> and it is debated whether he knew that the text was likely fabricated. Um, but that was enough, and so he made the change. Um, it's an interesting dynamic, the leaving it out and then adding back in. It highlights for us how important the form of the text was and the kinds of theological questions that could be raised as a result. Um, removing the Johannine comma, this important biblical basis for the doctrine of the Trinity according to the Latin tradition, had ramifications for Erasmus and for conversations surrounding the doctrine of the Trinity that would extend beyond the early modern period. And I would recommend um, Grantley McDonald's book on the Johannine comma, and he explores it from Erasmus all the way to today. So it's a really nice, helpful book in case you're wanting more after this lecture. <laughs> um, and, but you know, this is more than just a scholarly debate. The charge of heresy is a serious matter. It threatens not only livelihood, but life itself. And ultimately, it was his act of restoring the comma to the accepted text that saved Erasmus's life. This is when commas save lives. And this part of the duress that he faced is though not always drawn out of the story. Okay, now you guys get it, right? <laughs> All right. Um, it's estimated that between 1516 and 1800, Erasmus's New Testament appeared in more than 200 editions. Um, with the comma being the most notable alteration from the earliest versions to the editions that followed. So this is really the story, the main story. Um, among the translations that resulted from the lineage of his work, it is well known that the KJV would adopt the comma on its page, and so it would have a legacy in the English language as a result. Um, we also know that Luther's German translation of the Greek New Testament, remember it had been based on the second edition of the 1519 edition of Erasmus's Greek New Testament, and that didn't include the comma. So the Lutheran tradition has a, an interesting story that doesn't begin with the comma, and then eventually the comma is added in certain versions. Okay, and usually those are the parts of the story that people tell. So I want to talk about the Reformed tradition. Where did the Reformed tradition and the French Bible fit into this muddle? Although scholarship has tracked the typographical presence of the comma in a variety of vernacular Bibles, the French Bible has not yet been explored. So we will consider it in light of the legacy of Calvin and his, the, his discourse with Servetus, which actually, unfortunately, I had to kind of cut down a lot. I was going to tell you a lot about that. but. We can talk about it later. Um, so I'm going to begin with John Calvin. Let's, let's jump in with Calvin. Um, tracing John Calvin's engagement with the Johannine comma requires recognition that the accusations of anti-Trinitarianism dogged his reputation and occupied his consideration from early on. And that began with his debate against Pierre Caroli at the Lausanne Disputation in 1536 and continued throughout his life with Michael Servetus and Sebastian Caselio, among others. These accusations would even trouble his reputation after his death, as well as the reputation of his clerical legacy, reaching well into the 18th century. And you can see my book. And also, uh, Dr. Clover has also written on this topic. So um, Calvin's first edition of the Institutes is where we're going to, be to begin, 1536. I'm going to track the 1541 French edition, and then we'll move into his commentaries as a, a way of comparing. I know this is dense, so stick, stick with it. <laughs> Tracing John Calvin's engagement with the comma required recognition that, oh, sorry, I already said that. Okay, Calvin's first edition of the Institutes was published in 1536, and it actually makes no mention of the comma at all. But it does employ verse 6 and verse 8, and if we understand the interpolation primarily in verse 7, it means he jumps over verse 7, if he has access to it at all. Um, so it uh, explores verse 6 and verse 8 of 1 John 5. And the context of the conversation happens in issues of sacraments and baptism. This is actually a section that would be moved intact to book 4 of Calvin's Institutes in the 1559 edition. 
Importantly, this was written before Calvin's arrival in Geneva in August 1536 and the conflict that he faced with Caroli in October 1536. Additionally, this first edition of the Institutes was significantly influenced by Luther, who did not recognize or include the comma. In the passage, Calvin identifies the water, I don't know if you want to open your Bibles to 1 John, that might help, but identifies the water that's referenced there with one's baptism in Christ and the blood with one's redemption according to Christ's blood. The Spirit serves as the primary testimony in this work of confirming the testimony of these signs. And Calvin also links the reference to water and blood to John 19, um, and as we know it as verse 34, insofar as both the water and the blood flowed from the side of Christ. He appeals to Augustine's claim that Jesus is the wealth spring of sacraments in his evaluation of John, thereby showing how scripture and tradition align. And this is the first instance of Calvin identifying 1 John 5 verses with the confirmation of the inner testimony of the spirit, and that particular focus and emphasis would drive his consideration throughout. When we look at the French version of this section on sacraments that was published in 1541, Calvin again skips over verse 7, the actual comma, in order to make the case that there is a figurative correlation intended between sacraments of baptism and Eucharist with water and blood. This time he uses the word ransom instead of satisfaction. The role of the Holy Spirit receives a little more explanation for offering certainty by making us, quote, believe, understand, and know, for otherwise we could not grasp it. Eventually, the comma, that is verse 7 and part of verse 8, is addressed by Calvin in the Institutes, but this time directly in his discussion on the Holy Spirit. And that's a little bit of a surprise, frankly. Um, Calvin's 1536 section of the, Holy Spirit, uh, of the Holy Spirit is split up in the 1559 edition between Book 1 in relation to the doctrine of God and Trinitarian theology and Book 3 in regards to how the benefits of Christ are received. Although one might assume that Calvin, sensitive to accusations of anti-Trinitarianism, would reference the comma in book one in relation to the doctrine of God. Instead, Calvin reserves the reference for book three. In either case, Calvin does not acknowledge any concern or raise any questions about the validity of the passage. But his innovation is seen in the fact that he uses the text to confirm his doctrine of union with Christ rather than the doctrine of the Trinity. The entirety of Book 3 of Calvin's Institutes explores the way in which the benefits of Christ are received by the believer. The dilemma is clearly laid out from the start. Calvin writes, as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us. All that he possesses is nothing to us until we grow into one body with him. For Calvin, faith is the efficient cause, yes, but Calvin immediately emphasized we must elevate our understanding to see what is actually behind, and in this case he says above our faith. The way in which our salvation is truly imparted is through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's his words. By the time he gets to this point in the Institutes, he reminds the reader that he has already established the eternal divine essence of the Holy Spirit in book one. So the comma is only used indirectly to affirm the Trinity, but by way of affirmation of the Holy Spirit's crucial work in the salvation of the believer, leading to the believer's union with Christ. Calvin is bold in this decision based upon the repeated mention of the Spirit. So he actually reads into the interpolation to see that the text is trying to emphasize the Holy Spirit by saying the Spirit twice. (laughs) I love that. You can theologize anything. (laughs) As an intentional emphasis on the part of Scripture to stress the role of the Spirit in the order of salvation. This double emphasis conveys, in Calvin's words, how the Spirit seals the cleansing and sacrifice of Christ. 
And with added allusion to the Catholic epistle 1 Peter 1-2, Calvin links the Johannine comma to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and the doctrine of sanctification, which is the overarching focus of book three. Calvin concludes that Christ's shed blood can only hold its impact in us, that is ensure our eternal salvation, when our souls are washed by the secret watering of the Spirit, which is the means by which we are both cleansed and rendered fruitful gardens. Okay, so if we understand that the content of the Institute's functions to build ideas upon each other in a specific progression, then we can see that the Johannine comma themes of water and blood and emphasis on the Holy Spirit is functioning as a foundation for Calvin's later discussion discussion of duplex gratia, the double grace of justification and sanctification. Of course, when he talks about justification, the hinge upon which all religion turns, and he'll unpack, though, how that is linked to sanctification, though distinct. In all this, he concludes, the Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectually unites us to himself. So, I just love, that was such a fun discovery, frankly, because I did not expect it to be there, the conversation to be there, and then to see how the comma was functioning in in such an important way in his thought just got me thinking about a lot of different things. But (laughs) the idea that the comma may not be authentic is neither referenced nor is the comma used in the traditional way of girding the orthodoxy of the doctrine of the Trinity at least not in the Institutes. So let's look at Calvin's commentary on the first epistle of John very briefly, um, published in 1551. So Calvin doesn't grapple with the text um, until 1551 with the publication of his commentaries on the Catholic epistles. At this point, he is consistent in exploring the meaning of the blood and water and its echoes with John's gospel. This is something we'll continue to see how the reading of 1 John is done through the lens of the reading of John's gospel. At verse 7, Calvin expresses recognition that this is a disputed passage and that not all manuscripts include it. He acknowledges, quote, the whole of this verse has been by some omitted. But he notes that because Latin and Greek copies do not agree, he's unable to say anything about it. (laughs) Okay, so Calvin does not venture into humanist territory further, but instead communicates the ambiguity that has already been modeled by Erasmus himself. It's important to note that Servetus has not yet been caught in Geneva. The commentary falls two years before that event, and the function of the biblical commentary is also on full display here, noting complexities of the text that he's not going to explore in the institutes. The commentaries and institutes don't have the same function and purpose. Calvin expresses favor for the smooth flow of the passage, which highlights a pre-critical mindset that does not see perhaps the more difficult reading as the more accurate one. (laughs) Without committing either way, he translates with the comma and without the comma. And to me, that reflects, or sorry, he interprets the text with, if the comma is there and if it isn't there. And so the muddled state of the issue, I think, is no better seen in this decision. Again, the text is not used to bolster the united essence of the three persons, as the tradition has so often done, but instead Calvin leads towards an emphasis on the role of the Holy Spirit enabling the fruit of Christ's death to be ours. This Calvin's Institutes and his first John commentary agree in so far as the comma informs the discussion around the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But why? (laughs) Why is the bulk of Calvin's focus on the Holy Spirit? So I had hoped to include a whole, I actually wrote like a whole analysis, but it was like I doubled my paper size. (laughs) So um, I'm just going to give you a quick little summary, but... (laughs) um, Okay, so I wanted to to talk a little bit about Michael Servetus' 1531 text on the heirs of the Trinity. Um, Suffice it to say that what struck me about reading his text in light of this conversation 
was how much his discussion of the Johanna and comma, because he does engage with it, happens in the context of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. That's where Servetus is talking about the Johanna and comma, is in connection with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And that helped me to better understand, in part, Calvin's consideration of the comma um, and how it becomes increasingly linked to that doctrine so tightly. Um, for Servetus, John's gospel, in his reading of John's gospel, denies the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And this is where I would recommend Grant Lee McDonald's book. He talks a little bit about that with Erasmus and Servetus. As Servetus rejects the divinity of the Holy Spirit as a separate being, a view that he aligns with tritheism, Calvin conversely emphasizes the primary witness of the Holy Spirit through this passage. So they're like going in opposite directions in so many ways. It is true that Servetus had his own version of what I can only describe as a Arianism, Gnostic, Adoptionism, Modalism, Sibelianism <laughs> in response to what he regarded as false Trinitarian teaching of patristic and medieval theologians who were overly influenced by philosophy. However, it is, I think, the Macedonianism the denial of the divinity of the Holy Spirit that sets the trajectory, not only of Servetus's conversation, but of this discussion of the passage for Calvin. One can observe that Servetus expressed concern for how the Mohammedans and Jews would perceive Christianity on this matter of the Trinity. And this reflects his Spanish context and gives further insight into the judgment he received at his trial in Geneva in 1553. He was asked about his study of the Quran. So that's a piece of the puzzle, I think, that is not always brought to light when thinking through Servetus in Geneva. In the end, Servetus is surprised Surprisingly, this is the biggest surprise, Servetus does not reject the comma. He doesn't reject the comma as an interpolation. Instead, he reinterprets the comma as meaning, he, he reads it through a modalistic lens as three dispositions of one Yahweh revealed, but not in a metaphysical way. Interestingly, this means that Servetus accepted the comma but rejected the tradition's way of interpreting the text. Um, uh, sorry, he rejects the tradition's way of interpreting the text. He does not see it as a, a fabrication, and, but he sees it as the tradition twisting the true, um, and I think this is probably the best label for his view, but a Unitarian monotheism of Christianity. Um, as opposed to a Trinitarian monotheism, uh, just, just to distinguish. As we know, Servetus' acceptance of the comma was in the end insufficient to save his life, uh, given his rejection of the tradition, tradition's reading of the comma. So this is when commas don't save lives. <laughs> How was the passage navigated then on the pages of the French Bibles? And do we see the same ambiguity here as well? So one thing that you'll maybe be able to tell is that I am engaging in the Reformed hermeneutical circle, okay? So that hermeneutical circle uh, affirms Calvin's institutes, his commentaries, and the Bible. But sometimes we assume that we know which translation of the Bible people are using. And so it's really fun to explore the different versions of, of, of translations and editions. The Reformed tradition is interesting to track, I think, on this topic because its sources were published after Erasmus had already reinserted the comma. Furthermore, Reformed biblical scholarship coming out of Geneva had an outsized impact on the expansion of vernacular Bible translation because of the contributions of Robert Etienne or Stephanus and Theodore Beza to what would become the Textus Receptus published in 1633. 
We are quick to look, I think, at theological treatises and biblical commentaries for insight into these matters, but early modern Bibles intentionally developed and provided hermeneutical readings of scripture on their pages in material ways through book and chapter summaries, table charts, dictionaries, images, scriptural cross-references, and paratextual notations. The material culture of Bibles is steeped in theological import while also reflecting the confessional identity of the audience and conversely shaping the confessional idea, identity of the audience. So uh, in my view, Calvin's hermeneutical circle is in fact not complete if we don't pay, pay attention to the Bible. In this case, I'm gonna pay attention to the French Bible. Uh, the, you have, now your handout will be useful to you. <laughs> Enjoy, uh, though the, it's all in French, so maybe. Maybe some of you read French, but um, the first Bible to talk about is Jacques Lefebvre's Bible. This is the first French Bible of note um, for my purposes. Lefebvre was a humanist scholar and early reformer in France. He was connected to the reforming circle at Meaux and under the patronage of Marguerite of Navarre, the sister of King Francis I. Um, in 1523, he published his French New Testament in Paris with privilege, that's a big deal, uh, based on the Latin Vulgate. In 1530, he published the complete French Bible in Antwerp. That location should tell you that he got in trouble in between. From Paris to Antwerp. Okay. <laughs> Despite the Sorbonne's condemnation against him and his commentaries in 1525, which forced him to leave France for Strasbourg and the Netherlands, uh, Marguerite of Navarre was able to secure his refuge, and the Bible was successfully published as a result. In Lefebvre's translation, the Johannan comma is included without concern. A key feature of this Bible is its intentional lack of glosses. Some have said as reflective of a Renaissance concern with the bare reading of the text, while others claim that there is a liturgical purpose behind it. Nonetheless, it is notable that a small scriptural cross-reference in the margins of the section is included. The reference to John 3b, indicates that the conversation with Nicodemus served as a helpful lens through which to read the meaning of the Johannine comma. Indeed, many themes are echoed there in that section, including rebirth, the role of the spirit, and the power of faith in Christ to save. The trend of reading 1 John in light of the Gospel of John is a prominent feature throughout the centuries. These two books were read together. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about Lefebvre. Let's move on to the Olivetan Bible. In 1534, the year Luther's complete German Bible was published and Lefebvre's French Bible underwent a new edition, the Vaudois or Waldensians from the Valley of Piedmont were in the process of funding a French Bible translation to be based on the original languages of the Bible. At the Synod of saint Florent, September 1532, Calvin's cousin, Pierre Robert Olivetan, was called upon to translate. His New Testament was published in 1534 and the complete French Bible published in 1535. Okay, when we turn to the comma in 1 John 5, and remember that he's using biblical languages, um, we can see that unlike in Lefebvre's Bible, Olivetan expresses awareness of the textual variation in the margins of the text. There he acknowledges the potential inauthenticity of the text by explaining that from the word for to the word also, and that's because there's no verses yet, so he has to say it like that. Um, the passage is not found in several ancient texts of both Greek and Latin. Olivetan, meanwhile, follows in the footsteps of Lefebvre by also citing John 3b. And this is where we get those exegetical, we can see how exegetical histories and hermeneutics shape people's readings of the Bible. And so he further confirms that if you're gonna read this passage, you should read the story about Nicodemus um, as a way to better understand it. Um, and this functions, I think, as a kind of confirmation of consistency of authorial style and rhetoric, in addition to a thematic and therefore theological window to the text. So what this means is that Olivetan's Bible reflects early modern attention 
to the internal evidence within the text as well as awareness of textual variation. And as I look ahead to other French Bibles in the Geneva family lineage, the decision of the Olivetan Bible to include the comma in the main body, despite raising questions about textual legitimacy in the margins, is formative. And that will shape the content of French Bibles on this issue for as long as I am able to look at them. And that only goes to 1805, and that's as much as I can do. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> okay, so um, so I want to highlight how in the French tradition, it's the Olivetan Bible that is going to set the trend. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. If we look to Calvin's first revision of the complete Bible, so that's the next one I want to highlight for you. Don't worry, I'm not going to do all of these. Um, in 1546, published by Jean Giraud, we will see Calvin following in the footsteps of a Levitin with the inclusion of the comma in the main body and a paratextual notation that is typographically signaled by way of quotation. So that's another way that you would highlight that there's maybe a problem in the text, right? It could be italicized or you could put like a little asterisk, something like that. In this case, there were quotes that were put and then the notation explains what the quotes mean. Um, What's interesting to me is that the story of Nicodemus is no longer taught as a lens to read the comma. And that really fits, doesn't it, with what I already told you about what he's doing with the comma in the institutes and in the commentaries. He's not drawing from the Nicodemus story, so he doesn't put it in the reference of his Bible. Um, so that's interesting as well. And so this is where he highlights that there may be other, there are other examples, but you'll notice that the note itself is much diminished. We don't receive, we don't have as much information. We don't know that the exemplars are not in Greek or Latin. Um, it's, it's a very simple notation. By 1588, there's a major revision of the French Bible. And I have actually a chapter on this in one of <laughs> Scott's books, um, in case you're interested. And what I noticed there was that the marginal notation had been completely dropped, as well as the scriptural references. Um, so there is now no communication to the reader that there are other texts, that, that you know, the sources vary on this. Um, what we do see is innovation in the inclusion of an asterisk, which expands the semantic domain of the word one, in these three are one, to mean un mem shows the same thing. This is not something that is be theologically explained and is really open to interpretation. I really wondered, what does that mean? <laughs> Until I looked at the Sommer French Bible of 1619. When I looked at that French Bible, uh, I noticed that along with an added scriptural cross-reference, so they followed the 1588 French Bible almost exactly, except that it made reference to John 10, 30, which states, the Father and I are one. So it is like a later generation sort of defining what this means, what this new uh, language means theologically. And I was relieved. <laughs> in 1644, uh, uh, un mem shows would move from a paratextual notation to the main body of the text by, by, uh, under the pen of biblical scholar Giovanni Diodati. See, I am going to take you to the 19th century, so come with me. Diodati was born in Geneva in 1576 from a line of Italian refugees who came to Geneva from Tuscany. He taught theology at Geneva's Academy from 1609 until his death in 1649 and is known, this is how you probably know him, for serving as Geneva's representative at the Synod of Dort. His focus on Bible translation began in 1620. He famously translated the Bible into Italian, which was published by Pierre Chouet in 1641. During this century, there were concerns about the rapid progression of the French language, as well as advances in biblical exegesis. And that led to the move to revise the 1588 French Geneva Bible. So Diodati has set out to revise the 1588 French Geneva Bible. From the start, 
Um, oh, I was going to say, because the volume is published in a folio size, there's a whole lot of space for glosses. And this is a very fun Bible to research. <laughs> So from the start, Diodati uses the argument or summary at the start of the Catholic epistles to claim 1 John as confirmation of the prologue of John. So again, we see this tradition of reading those two texts together and helping to understand the together. The value of 1 John is due to its affirmation, quote, of the very sacred trinity, the person of Christ in his office, and the benefits of redemption, adoption, regeneration, and glorification for the faithful. Diodati transitions into echoes of Calvin, stressing the teaching of 1 John as confirmation of the Holy Spirit, bringing a necessary illumination of understanding to interpret God's word rightly. By the time we get to verse 7, Diodati offers a long notation. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. There he impacts the significance of the passage in terms of the doctrine of the Trinity as a clear affirmation of the unity of the three persons in essence and in perfect union of operation. That is his reason for translating the text, un mem shows, or same thing. That's how he uh, explains that choice. Moreover, Diodati's notations further confirm the reformed move to use the Johannine comma as confirmation of the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. Diodati explained, God's testimony is taught by the external word, is written in the hearts of the faithful by the work of the Holy Spirit. By highlighting the resonance of his points with confirmations from other verses, and he cites a lot of different verses, John 14, 15, 16, all different ones. Diodati teaches that the Holy Spirit is the one who whispers to believers the secrets of God. The continuity is evident in the way in which the three confirm the truth of the other. He cites John 5 and John 8 in that regard. So hermeneutically speaking, then we, again, can see how the first epistle of John was read in light. I've already said that several times. But confirming, I think, that authorial coherence and clarity. And I think further boosting, actually what it's doing is boosting the validity of the interpolation, right? It, that's what it's, how it's uh, functioning. Diodati's Bible is an excellent example of how the Bible at a folio size could function as a biblical commentary. So don't just think of it as a Bible, but also a commentary. And it was especially intended for pastors given the size and function of the folio in the church context. Revealing passages and doctrines shaping confessionalization in the Reformation's aftermath. Nevertheless, he does not grapple at all with the textual witness on the pages of scripture, even though the glosses of those pages reflect highly sophisticated theological discussion. Now, my reading of why doesn't he mention it is based on the fact that just a decade before Diodati's translation, the Textus Receptus codified the Greek text, meaning the comma, and using Bez's version, which I think renders the question, at least at that time, kind of a settled issue until later questions would surface in the coming century. So that's my reading of why he's not mentioning it on, in his Bible, because he definitely could have. In conclusion, all of the French Protestant Bibles that I have tracked thus far, though don't worry, I'm still looking, include the comma. They all include the comma. There's only two major additions over the course of three centuries that raise a question about the textual veracity of the comma, namely a Levitin's Bible and Calvin's Bible. The early dating of the Bibles, I think, are evidence of the particular tension toward humanist concerns at the time, that confessional camps are not yet established, and Calvin is probably following in a Levitin's footsteps at this point. It is very possible that a Levitin was encouraged by Erasmus' decision to resurrect the comma for his third edition, even though he indicates awareness of the problem. Whatever the reason, Olivetan's decision to highlight disagreement among textual authorities and yet to keep the text nonetheless in the main portion of the Bible gave confidence to later editions to maintain the comma. Eventually, any note of caution disappears. When anti-Trinitarian accusations were levied against Calvin's Geneva and his clerical legacy during the Age of Enlightenment by philosophe Voltaire, surprisingly, 
It was not because they removed the Johannine comma from the Bible. Those certain accounts have tried to make that the case. In the Reformed tradition, the Johannine comma survived on the pages of French Protestant Bibles from humanism all the way through the French Revolution and the onset of the Napoleonic era. And by the time Geneva's company of pastors finally published a new translation in 1805, the comma remained newly established for a new century and without scriptural cross-references. Uh, the chapter summary, though, much reduced by the revision of 1712, which is listed on your note, reflects a robust theological discussion in 1805 again, so it expands at this point. In the aftermath of anti-Trinitarian accusations, Geneva's 1805 French Bible exclusively emphasizes the passage as supporting the divinity of Christ. This reflects a divergence from earlier uses that emphasize the doctrine of the Holy Spirit based on Calvin's own approach and in response to Servetus. It seems that in the aftermath of very harmful press from the French philosophers of the Enlightenment, where they're accused of Socinianism on the pages of the Encyclopédie, no less, the 1805 French Bible offers affirmations, very clear affirmations of Christ's divinity. By this point, the comma was again the traditional proof for battling against Arianism until the rise of modern textual criticism. Okay, in conclusion, in the case of the comma, left without sophisticated tactics for evaluating variants, starting with Erasmus and without true access to earlier manuscripts for comparative stake, theological coherence became a primary mark of authenticity. The history of the Johannine comma during the Reformation and beyond gives us insight into how difficult it was to identify interpolation when there was no theological dissonance. <laughs> the reformers expected for orthodox doctrine to be confirmed in scripture by scripture according to the principle that scripture is self-interpreting. The comma was thereby valued for its clear affirmation of the doctrine of the Trinity that did not contradict orthodox teachings of the faith confirmed by the tradition but rooted in scripture. This aligned with the mainstream reformers view that while doctrine could not originate outside of scripture in its substance, the theological language used to represent those ideas could be derived from outside of scripture's language. Even the most difficult passage could be understood through the lens of other clearer passages of scripture and I think that's what's happening between 1 John 5 and, and John's Gospel. Scriptural cross-references noted in the margins become not only a matter of formatting, but actually theological affirmation of the univocal quality of scripture. Other factors were at play that made this difficult to sort out. As mentioned already, limited access to a variety of manuscripts, both geographical and linguistic, prevented careful analysis. But even when, and this is a point that's often made by Erasmian scholars, that even when Erasmus did consult the Codex Vaticanus, he didn't know what he had. <laughs> he didn't know what he was looking at. And so he doesn't end up using it. Um, and I can talk about this in, in any questions, but it, it's part of kind of a disparagement that the Latin church um, looks down upon the Greek and Greek manuscripts and Greek language and also a false understanding of what happened at the Council of Ferrara in the mid 15th century. All of those things play into a mentality that doesn't value a text like that, which we know is so valuable. Um, the inability to weigh the value of different textual witnesses stunted the decisions unknowingly of biblical scholars then. This really became clear to me when I was writing about Theodore Beza as biblical scholar for Beza's 500th anniversary. He, um, Beza had come into possession of Codex Vesey from 1562 to 1581. It's a fifth century unctual hand in both Greek and Latin. And during that time, he used its witness sparingly to shape the annotations in the text of the New Testament, and then he passed it on to the University of Cambridge. And in a letter to the university, he describes the codex in rather bleak terms. He says, he describes it as incomplete, insufficiently preserved, and inappropriately marked on. 
Beza rightly notices the amount of variations evident in comparison to the accepted versions of the time, and he therefore describes the codex as not very correctly copied. <laughs> Consequently, he suggested that the codex be stored rather than published to avoid controversy. Now add to that the stresses and disruptions of the Reformation as confessional camps with political loyalties began to emerge, and it, I think it becomes harder and harder to remove the comma. The printing press in a way compounded the problem because it made the textus receptus possible. And only with the printing press could identical mass copies be made. And this is going to facilitate the expansion of vernacular translations with the comma included, as we saw in the French um, Protestant Bible. Although using the comma to combat Arianism and support Trinitarian thought was a key aspect of the story and indeed did save a life, a look at Reformed theology and scripture also reveals the expansive reach of the commas used theologically to confirm the inner testimony of the spirit, a distinctive theological emphasis in the reformed tradition. At the end of the day, the Johannine comma had the power to save lives both spiritually and practically or politically insofar as it was valued in its time. Unfortunately, this, of course, misguided constraint delayed the truest form of the text until later centuries began to critique the idea of a single received text. Thankfully, the doctrine of the Trinity never depended solely on the Johannine comma, a text that did not even exist when the early church was clarifying its beliefs according to scripture. Ultimately, the interpolation of the comma reflects the Reformation's interplay between scripture and theology, wherein theological coherence function as the arbiter of truth in the absence of informed textual evaluation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Bigman, for your... Did I go over? Is it really late? I have no idea. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have now some time for questions. So there is a microphone in the back, or if you'd prefer, I can come to you with this microphone. So as you are cogitating on your questions, I thought I'd kick things off. Oh, sure. Um, and I, and I, I'm, I, I'm still chewing it up myself, oh. but I, what I found so intriguing about the, the story you told is that there is a two-way street between textual criticism and doctrinal concerns. And I found that really interesting and surprising. Right, like that the, the difference between being called an Arian and not being an Arian might hinge on you know, a particular textual critical view you hold. That's, I found that stimulating. For the first thing I want to ask, is that a right way to characterize the kinds of debates that were happening? But secondarily, like when we approach our Bibles and when we start thinking in ways like how, how best to be biblical Christians but also Trinitarian Christians, how should we balance those two um, dynamics in ways that uh, are faithful to the lessons we learned in Reformation history? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, one of the approaches that I'm always trying to do with my work is to build the mentality of the, of the people of that time. You know, what are the things that they could imagine or expect? And um, in the case of uh, French Bibles, there's, there's a lot of data that's given to you about the mentality of, of a person approaching the biblical text, or at least the intended mentality. And what's fascinating to me is how in the Bible prophecies themselves, if you track them, I did that for a different paper some other time. Um, if you track them, if first the Bible prophecies talk about how um, scripture has not been um, accessible, that Satan has been at work in hiding the text, and that this, you know, this is the Holy Spirit bringing the gospel to light, and you know, those kinds of things, right? Um, but by the by Theodore Bayes' time, so that's really third generation, the French Bible prophecies have shifted. And now the problem is different. They're like, there's too many Bible translations, and who's overseeing these Bible translations, and Satan is, is behind it, you know? And I just thought, oh, that's so fascinating because, in fact, they're just experiencing this media revolution. They're experiencing this a new dynamic where it's very difficult to, to censor, and therefore you can publish a Bible without privilege. I mean, um, you know, 
We see that in the story of the French Bible. It's published without privilege until the company of pastors kind of step in as functional uh, authority. And so, um, so I think that that, so all that to say is that the Bible that they're using really matters. The Bible that's being used from the pulpit, the Bible that's being read out loud, the Bible that's being read in the taverns, um, in Geneva, you had to have a Bible in the taverns as well. Um, you know, whatever, that does shape the conversation and shape the discussion, and, and they're really focused on the importance of that um, translation. So, uh, and then you asked the second part, <laughs> which was kind of balancing dynamics, is that? Yeah, so if, if the Bible we use really matters, yeah. then it seems like it matters because we might have some Bibles that are more Trinitarian than others, right? Oh, that's a, yeah. Right, that, that's, and that, that's a, it's striking to me that there isn't like this foundation. The, 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 like it doesn't seem like there's a foundation that, from which the Trinity is built. Well, it seems like it's two ways. Well, they're trying to do that foundation with the Texas Receptus, and I think it's a really good effort. I think the thing that we need to appreciate is that um, there is just an explosion of vernacular Bibles that are happening in the 16th century. And so they're kind of like working it out. And actually the model that they use can be the model that we use, which is that if you're translating a Bible or if you're reading a Bible, you don't do it in one language. Like you would, especially I'm speaking to scholars here, but to be able to engage with multiple languages and multiple translations of the Bible is I think the best way to approach it. Thank you so much. This was truly an integrative lecture. You hit both church history, theology, biblical studies. I love this. <laughs> uh, I guess my question would be, as a result of your research, how does Calvin come out? Because he, he yeah. seemed to avoid the easy yeah. anti-Trinitarian accusation. He didn't mention the common, the early edition, when he could have. Yeah. And then when he does write the commentary on 1 John, you, apparently he gave it uh, both ways, a version so of with the comma way. and without the comma. It, it, well, how did you think? Is, does he come out with a I better was... reputation? Or <laughs> was... <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's funny. Um, I was surprised. It, it's always fun to not know what you're going to discover. You know, That's probably my favorite part about doing historical analysis. Um, so that's such a great question. Um, I think what I came to appreciate was, again, just the importance of really historical theology and being able to kind of track the development as it's happening, you know, and then in the, and then I, my reading on the differences between the institutes and the commentaries would come from knowing that those texts are different in their purposes. Um, uh, so that's, that's one thing that um, the commentary itself too, it, I was fascinated by the fact that it's written before Servetus is executed, and we see that by the, by the 1559 edition of the Institutes, Calvin is really talking, um, you know, that there's a whole section to Servetus that has completely expanded, right, the Institutes by 1559, and, but that conversation is happening in the doctrine of God and the um, and Trinitarian theology. So it's, it's, you know, so I feel like he's kind of building on these different things and piecing it together and we can see different parts of it in, in, in different places. Um, but it's still muddled. I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my take on it. It's, it's almost like he doesn't, he doesn't want to stand on either side and probably, my guess is, he is quite sensitive to the anti-Trinitarian accusation. So he's like, take it or leave it. We can do it either way. <laughs> so I don't know, but I have to keep thinking about it. It's a good question, and that's definitely one that's intriguing me right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Just a small comment, it's just basically a PS, that when you uh, get to the latter part of the uh, 17th century, the issues are also complicated by the reaction of the French Protestants to Catholics. Yes. And so that in the, by the time you get to the 1660s and 1670s, both in Geneva and in France, there's a feeling that the Diodati version and also the Genevan version are insufficient 
to deal with the Catholic publications of the 1660s, yeah. which are taking Paris because they're more beautifully written. And see, that leads up to what is known as the Charitan Bible Project of the 1670s, in which the Genevans and the French work together. So the, the, I just really love the fact that you were bringing social history, because when you get into this, this topic, the issue of social history plays a key role in terms of what people think they have to do with Bibles, and, it was, and, and frankly, it became a competitive issue yes. with Catholics. And so, and the, the issue is so severe that uh, the, the, by the 1670s, uh, the issue is that Catholicism may do very, very well unless there's a new translation that comes out immediately, that the translation fell apart. It's, it's a social history. Well, no, I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's there's so much to cover. <laughs> I did, um, I, you know, I, I have also been looking at Catholic French Bibles so that I can compare the two and sometimes find some striking similarities and shared shared aspects. But you're exactly right that it is that the printing industry is really significant in shaping these Bibles and the little additions that are added, the supposed revisions, sometimes not really much, but you know you need to, to sell that new edition. Um, so sorting some of those things out is fascinating. Um, I, you know, I did a, a pro I did a project on Calvin's catechism at one point. I was trying to see how long Calvin's catechism was used, and I was really encouraged to discover that when the 18th century church was rethinking Calvin's catechism that it was actually about language. It was more about the French language and about the theological topics. And that's, so I, I've taken that, you know, research and discovery, and I think that plays into the Bible because um, we maybe forget how rapidly the, lang the vernacular languages are changing in this time period. And it's not that the other Bible was so bad, but that they, they really need a new one so that people can understand the text because as I like to tell my students, right, the whole purpose is for the text to be understood, right? It's not, you know, it's, that is, that's its value there is that the gospel would be proclaimed. So we can retranslate it. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your comment. Do you think that the comma belongs in the main body of our Bibles today, or should it just be in a footnote? I don't think it should be in the main body. Um, I can see why, you know, it is, very, it is a bit deceiving because of the way that it draws the comparison between the, by saying, you know, these three in heaven, and also, that also word is very deceiving in that it, it it aligns it, um, and I feel like it takes it away from what the the water context is meant to mean. Um, I like the instinct of trying to understand what is John talking about when he says water and blood and spirit. You see those themes in his gospel. The gospel can be useful in sort of making sense of that. But I'm really in favor of adding it to a, a note in a, in a nice study Bible because it has had such a huge impact on the history of the church in the West. And I think it's, it's valuable and helpful. And again, it's like we're not being silent about these things. And I think that's an important um, just disposition. We have time maybe for one last question. I got to meet Jeff recently. <laughs> Dr. Matt, this is fantastic. Thanks Thank so much. I, I was here. just curious, does Theodore Beza and his annotations, like how, where does he go with this? Is he yeah. kind of still sort of kind of straddling like Calvin is, or is he more kind of like a, a forerunner per se for right. you know, the French Bible? It's such a good question. Um, so I am really uh, have appreciated the work of Kranz. Crans, yes. Um, what is the title? Do you remember? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Beyond. Beyond. Yeah. So what I love about what Crans has done is he, and this is the same that's happened with Erasmus, is that there's been a corrective about did Erasmus intend to do the, to publish the Greek New Testament, or was he actually trying to do a Latin translation? a new Latin translation. And so when I was doing 
that research, I was like, oh, this fits exactly with what Kranz is saying about what's happening with Beza, which is that Beza is much more attuned, like interested in his Latin translation than he is in the Greek. Um, and so I think part of it is because they don't really know what they're doing in some ways. You know, they don't know how to sort some of the problems out, and that was a great example. Um, so I have not looked at that source, but I, in looking at Bayes' Bible, I, I wonder if it's just accepted without any reference. Um, I do know, though, from other research that, of course, Bayes' decisions uh, on the comma, which is to include it, you know, are going to go into the Texas Receptus, and that's going to have a huge impact on all these vernacular Bibles. So, um, yeah, but I don't know that he could have... It doesn't seem that anybody in that time could have evaluated it differently. They just didn't have the tools to do that. And in that way, you just can't hold it against them. Theological coherence is a valid basis for keeping something in. It's not the same as when they deal with the Apocrypha and they say that theological, you know, this is a, there's a theological dissonance here. Um, you know, so it's, it's not the same as the Apocrypha. The comma's a little, little different. <laughs> <laughs> All right, please join me in showing our appreciation to Dr. <laughs>